Hey, thank you. <laughs> First of all, uh, it's a real honor to be at this occasion celebrating the 500th anniversary of Leonardo's Codex. And you have, will have seen with all the publicity that's been done around this conference, right, there's been a digital version of this, right, Vitruvian Man, right, that Leonardo da Vinci originally put forward in 1490. Uh, and it's a very interesting kind of representation of the human condition. Uh, and I want to sort of have us think about this a little bit, because one of the things that it draws attention to, I think, is the fact that the human is actually up for grabs in terms of what it refers to. And so this is why I entitled this talk, The Fork in the Road for the Future of Humanity. Because it's quite clear that the idea of human beings as homo sapiens and the way we normally understand it is in a very unstable position. And starting with someone like Leonardo da Vinci is quite in instructive in this regard. Now I have to say, uh, I'm a professor of sociology at University of Warwick, and a, a lot of my colleagues, when they look at this picture, will see a white male. Okay, and, that, and they will focus on that and, you know, give the sort of line, this is a kind of Eurocentric representation of a human being and so forth. But from Leonardo's standpoint, and this was a point that was actually quite relevant to Renaissance humanism, and that is where the concept of humanism in the modern sense originated, the interesting thing is the proportions, right? The proportions of the body. The reason why this is called Vitruvian Man is after the Roman architect Vitruvius, who basically had this kind of, he had a kind of theory of architecture which basically said that all well-designed buildings are based on specific sorts of mathematical proportions. And Leonardo da Vinci, right, living in a period of Christianity believe, who believed that human beings are created in the image and likeness of God and that God is a designer, that if there is a, a design, a proportionality to buildings, there should be a proportionality to us that actually represents the proportions by which God created the universe. Okay, so it's a kind of micro, human being should be understood in Leonardo's vision, and I think this is a vision that has been very important in the modern era and drives the kind of concerns that we're talking about today, that the human being is a micro, a microcosm, right? It is, in other words, a small-scale representation of everything happening in the universe. And the way this is, you know, most obviously expressed in science is from the idea that there is, that the whole universe can be understood in terms of a finite set of physical laws, right? That is kind of, the, you might say, the strongest legacy of this, that everything, no matter how different it appears, is actually part of a common set of laws. And human beings are part of that. And not only that, human beings are privileged because we can understand that through mathematics. This is the kind of idea that Leonardo is actually projecting in the idea of the Vitruvian image, in the Vitruvian man. And it is the idea that I think has been driving modern science and technology. Now, we have reached a point at the beginning of the 21st century where, you know, as it were, all the chickens that are implied here are coming home to roost. And there's a sense in which we have to actually re we have to reconceptualize our understanding of who we are in this universe that we're coming to a greater and greater understanding of. And not only a greater and greater understanding, but greater control, power, and therefore responsibility. And that is where we are. And the fork in the road, at a very fundamental level, has to do with two ways in which humanity can go in the future. Both of them are drawing on the legacy of the past, of the sort that I've already described. One of them is post-humanism, and the other is transhumanism. And I want to say something about both of these views, because they are really quite uh, polar views. They're drawing on the same past, but they actually draw quite different implications about what human, human beings need to do, uh, not only in order to survive, but to flourish in the future. Now, one way to think about this is to look at what is called the Anthropocene. So the Anthropocene is an idea that geologists are currently floating about that is related to the issue of climate change. And what it, what it specifies is that human beings, at least since the start of the Industrial Revolutions, where you start to see a spike in carbon emissions, are in fact the single species most responsible for climate change. And, not, and, and when we understand climate change, of course we think about this in very apocalyptic terms, but climate change, of course, involves all the various changes that have taken place on Earth with regard to the ecology and so forth, 
Okay? And the human beings are really the principal cause of that. That is what the Anthropocene is. Now, you can interpret this phenomenon, which, which has a general amount of agreement within the scientific community, as either something that, says, that speaks to the strength of humanity or the fatal flaw of humanity. The transhumanists talk about it in terms of the strength, that in some sense the Anthropocene indicates that we, we are getting some kind of control over the planet in the sense that we are remaking it in our own image. And that is what all those carbon emissions are really about in the end. Whereas the post-humanists will say, no, what it shows is that the humans have gone too far and that we are in fact jeopardizing the entire ecology, all living things. So this is a fork on the road. This is the main fork on the road, I would say. And I think this is going to be defining the politics of the future, much more so than left and right. In fact, I talk about it in terms of up and down. Instead of left-winger, right-winger, we will have up-winger, down-winger, OK? And the difference is really, you know, and, and the metaphor of up and down is quite in, in, informative here. Because the transhumanists, the people who say that the Anthropocene is a sign that we are in control of stuff, OK, basically have a very kind of fluid idea of what the human condition is. Right? They look at the history of humanity as one of continual dynamism and self-transformation. We go from the caves to the skyscrapers, right? We stay from being on Earth to going to the moon. That's the human condition as far as a transhumanist is concerned. And the human being radically transforms their bodies and their social relations along the way in very radical kinds of ways. In fact, the most fundamental principle of transhumanism is morphological freedom. Morphological freedom. And that is a very interesting idea. Because historically speaking, the concept of the human has not necessarily been tied to any clear material being. Right? Human is primarily a normative category. Right? It is, so, so you might say you start with the upright ape, and then you educate them to become human. Right? That was the classic way of doing it. You humanize people. And humanize in that respect is kind of a synonym for civilize. OK? And in fact, it is, not, it is not even the case that humans, from a biological standpoint, are identified exclusively with apes until the mid-18th century with Linnaeus's coinage of Homo sapiens. OK? And this is not by accident that it happens at that time, because it's only then that you get, as it were, a critical mass of apes on the horizons of Europeans. Leonardo da Vinci didn't think a human was necessarily an ape. And in fact, people like Leonardo and others in his time who were imagining intelligences and so forth on other planets weren't imagining apes. OK? So the idea that even we are an upright ape is a relatively modern idea. Because the, and the notion of human nevertheless existed the whole time. And this is why it is not so strange for transhumanists to say, well, you know, um, Yes, human beings in their current biological body, uh, they're humans. But why not artificial humans? Why not androids? Why can't we count them as humans? Right? Why not? Now, you see, that is not a, that is not a strange idea if you look at the history of what human means, because it has never been tied so specifically to any particular biological being. So while we look at, let's say, the uh, fables of Aesop, which has all these animals, right, doing human-like things. And we say, oh, Aesop, he's anthropomorphizing. Well, no, actually, that's not how it was understood. In fact, these animals were seen to have, in, in certain respects, human-like traits. So they overlapped with the human in various respects. It wasn't just a metaphor or allegory or something like that. They actually thought that, OK? And the more we learn about genetic overlap between animals and human beings, that's not such a crazy idea. OK, so the point here is human is a floating signifier. And that's why transhumanists have this idea of morphological freedom on the table. And they believe humans can transform. They can be in diverse forms. And I'll say something about that at the end, because that's a very interesting proposition. And that, I think, is the thing you need to hold on to about transhumanism. But post-humanism offers the ultimate critique. 
Namely, we are ultimately natural biological creatures, upright apes, living a finite amount of time, and can only survive in an environment in consort with all the other creatures. And we are just wiping them out right and left, radically changing the ecosystem, not knowing what the consequences are, and we are setting ourselves a path to doom and destruction. Right? Biocide. Right? This is the people who talk about the Anthropocene the most, right, are those people. And they say that the, that the solution to this problem is not more science and technology in the way it has been developed over the last 200, 300, 400 years, but rather it is to pull back. And it is in this context that you may have heard of the precautionary principle, right, which is a kind of Hippocratic oath that is applied to uh, the way we operate in innovation. Namely, unless you can ensure that no harm will be done, don't do it. Right? Above all, do no harm. Now, if we actually applied that ethic, noble as it sounds, to the history of science and technology, especially the history of medicine, we'd be nowhere today. I just put that on the table as a fact. What the implications that you draw from it is another matter, but the point is the precautionary principle actually is quite a radical constraint on the way in which science and technology has developed that has enabled it to, ena to allow human beings to be the kind of distinctive species that we are today. But that is on the table from the post-humanists as the only way in which we can ensure mutual survival, because we are not going to survive alone. We either survive with all the other species or we all die together. There is no Elon Musk planet out there. Right? Transhumanists like Elon Musk, who would be a, a good example, right, thinks, OK, if we trash this planet, we got the next one to go to. And there are billions out there. And that's why it's good now to start developing rockets and you know, setting up space colonies. And maybe Thomas Cook can get into this business in terms of interplanetary travel. right? Um, and, and, and so you know, this, is, th 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 this is kind of the way the transhumanist looks at the environmental crisis, right? that there is an opportunity there, right? that yes, let's write off the Earth. Right? We've, got a, we've got a big universe out there, right? and, we're, and we understand it, right? and we, we, we don't understand it perfectly, but we understand it enough to be able to launch rockets and space probes and God knows what else. And that is what makes humanity distinctive, and we should carry on this way. So transhumanists are not deterred by the kinds of threats right, that the, that the post-humanists are laying at our feet. They're not deterred. They see opportunities. Where the post-humanists see threats, the transhumanists see opportunities. But remember, the transhumanists are quite willing and quite fluid about how they understand the human, whereas the posthumanists are very much tied to the idea that the human is homo sapiens, it is a biological creature, it is not a machine, it is not an android, you cannot upload your consciousness, right? You're either in this body or you're nobody, right? So there's a real big difference about just how flexible how morphologically free you are as a human being. That is part of the background assumption of transhumanism and posthumanism. Now I'm going to end by talking about the kind of, let's say you accept transhumanism. Because I imagine if we've got the 50 top innovators here, I think my, you know, my sense is you guys are risk takers, you guys like to you know, think outside of the box and all the rest of it. And so that your inclination, if you had to choose between transhumanism and posthumanism, would be to choose transhumanism. But the thing is, what kind of a world would that be even if we don't have an environmental catastrophe? So let's take the environmental catastrophe off the table. Let's say all this combined intelligence in the room can solve all those problems. Nevertheless, what you are entertaining is the idea that the human can come in multiple forms. right? So the human can come as an upright ape, and that upright ape may not just live for 80 years or something, but through various forms of genetic re-engineering, that ape might live forever. What does that do to the human condition as we normally understand it, even for the human beings who look pretty much like us? OK? So transhumanism wants to get rid of dying okay, in, in the biological body. They want to reverse aging. They want to solve the problems that are associated with that. That's one issue. Another is, OK, we upload our minds into machines. And then, of course, we've got the in-between option of being a cyborg where somehow you're interfacing with the machine. You meld with the machine. Now, how do you have something called human rights in that context? Right? Because the idea of human rights typically presupposes that the differences between people are, in fact, 
relatively minor, at least from the standpoint of their humanity. And that has a lot to do with the fact that people are sort of living roughly the same lives for the same number of years and so forth. And so issues like gender difference and race difference and class difference are seen as relatively superficial, at least they ought to be, from the standpoint of human rights. But now we're envisaging the possibility of much wider material embodiment differences than we have in the past. Can you have a unified theory of human rights for a world that accommodates some biological humans who live forever, some who live the normal life, some who are cyborgs, and some who are effectively androids? Thank you.